Like a lot of people in the field, I started working on image processing problems as a researcher. And I was working on biomedical image analysis. And about yeah, three years ago, a startup asked me, hey, how would you like um, working on deep learning in the wild, like really applying it to um, some real world problems? And I thought, cool, I've been working on applied image processing. No problem, can't be that different, right? Um, and I figured out, oh, there is actually quite a few things that differ to the research world. And I want to use my four minutes to quickly share a few lessons of um, what are the differences. So interestingly, um, which is maybe also because there's this huge hype about AI and people so excited about it. And I used to work with handcrafted features before. And it's just like, you're so excited about it. And you're like, yay, end-to-end -end learning. Uh, we can finally do all these problems that we weren't able to do before. And you see some data, and you're like, wow, this data is perfect. I want to analyze this tomorrow. And you kind of get ahead of yourself. And um, it's really uh, difficult when like two months into the project, suddenly the customer comes and he's like, yeah, this is nice. We like this model. But you know, actually, we needed this much faster. And then you're like, oh, no. <laughs> but I have known this uh, at first. So because the problem is all these technical details, uh, they matter a lot when it comes to architectures. Um, like in this case, I'm talking about deep neural network architectures. And what was also really interesting to me was that some architectures that are considered state of the art, where most researchers in the community would agree, hey, this is a really good model, um, sometimes in real life actually don't perform so well. So I brought one example. So um, this is for object detection in images, very specific example. You have an image, maybe there's a cat on the image, you try to put a box around the cat, or you want to try to put a box around an apple. And there are certain architectures. This is really just a small selection. And the axis here is inference time in milliseconds on a GPU. So for example, this faster RCNN used to be state of the art in 2016. It was really, really slow, uh, but quite good in 2016. And recently, there are some better architectures that have better performance and are faster. Better performance as mean average position on Coco, which um, well, in terms of accuracy, uh, a lot of customers are actually not interested in mean average position. And also, Coco has some uh, weird things when it comes to bounding box sizes. So I've had a data set where basically all this plot didn't really mean anything, and um, architectures performed very differently. And I've brought this little list of things, uh, especially also speed and deployment, because like this axis down here is inference time on a GPU which for some customers doesn't matter because they have want to run this on mobile phones, for example. And then also this plot can be quite different. And one last thing what I really wanted to mention is also testing. So a lot of people who come from the research world, it's like they get a batch of images or data, and they're like, OK, let's split this, I don't know, 75% training, 25% test. And you know, it works really well if you want to publish a paper. But if you want to run models um, in production, it really makes a huge difference if it's anyhow possible to ask a customer, please uh, give us some training data. We developed a model on that. We kind of do some validation, of course. Uh, but then please give us an additional test batch, like a new fresh batch of images, um, ideally like a huge, huge batch of images. And then let's see how that performs there, because that says a lot more about how these models uh, actually uh, perform in production settings. Yeah, so <laughs> that's already it from my side. Please, uh, after the like, talks and the break, please talk to me. Thank you very much.